Uh, hi everyone. Uh, today we will be talking about Rat. This is the final book in the Faithful and the Fallen, and this is the wow. Everyone has their book, <laughs> and I have my book here. And yeah, so this is the final uh, discussion on the Faithful and the Fallen. Uh, we've been doing this for four months now. Malice discussion was on Philip's channel. Uh, Valor discussion was on uh, Alan's channel. And ruins, the ruin discussion was on Abby's channel. And now today we will be talking about Rat. And we have a special guest today. It is John Gwynn himself, the man, Hello. the legend. <laughs> Yay! Thanks for inviting me. I'm honored to be here, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being here. And today we have again the same uh, person we have been discussing, uh, Abby, Alex, Alan, and Philip. So yeah, first we will be talking about non-spoiler. And once uh, we get into the spoilery part, we will, we will be talking about the spoiler all the way. So we will, we will be telling you to go away for now <laughs> if you haven't read the book. So yeah, uh, to get things started, because we have all read the books, uh, let's just pick. Uh, which one is your favorite book of the entire series? Uh, let's start from Abby. Oh, oh, the thing is, it's so hard to pick. Yeah, a it's favorite. hard, right? <laughs> <laughs> Pressure to pick a favorite. So I was thinking about this just before joining because I was like, I need, I need to probably pick one, and I think it might be Ruin, oh, just really? because of some of the scenes in it. But the thing is, that probably could change tomorrow, <laughs> <laughs> and it might be Wrath tomorrow. How about you, Alex? Wrath. Uh, I was one of those that every book to me got better and better. So every book that I read was then my favorite. And Wrath, I mean, the last quarter of it is a gigantic battle, which is exactly what I wanted it to be. So yeah, definitely uh, Wrath. And personally, I have to agree with uh, Alex because I think the book got the, the series got better with each book. And how about you, Alan? Wrath, uh, Wrath, because really? <laughs> yeah, Wrath is the last, I mean, the 250 page like war scene. Like it's just... And plus, Wrath, Wrath wraps ev like I love when books just like wrap everything up. Yeah. And like every like many things that uh, not everything I wanted to happen happened, but <laughs> everything that I wanted resolved was resolved, which which I liked a lot. Um. And so yeah, yeah. And plus, you know, I love I love military fantasy. And so when there's a battle scene going on for two hundred fifty pages, are you kidding? Like it's awesome. Yeah. How about you, Philip? I'm going to back up Abby and I'm going to go with Ruin. Uh -huh. And that's because I, I'm just, this is a, uh, everything that Alan and Alex said about Wrath, I agree with uh, as well. But I think, John, if, if I can call you John, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah of course. Cool. Uh, so I think your, your range in Ruin was just tremendous. I loved Ruin. I, I thought that was uh, just a, a beautiful book. And like Abby said, it had some beautiful, iconic moments in it. I just love the range. You had some great comedy in there. You had some very moving. I think I cried the most in Ruin. Mm, yeah. uh, just the combination of that. And of course, the action is, is there <laughs> as it is in all other books. So I, for me, Ruin just edges out Wrath, although I was very satisfied with the ending as well. I think Ruin has my favorite scene, which is, can we talk, we can talk spoilers for Ruin, surely, right? Yeah, like yeah. Cool. yeah. Yes. My favorite scene where Veritas kicks the freaking effigy <laughs> chest into the fire. And is like, screw you, Calidus. Like, I stood up and cheered. I was so happy. That's got to be my favorite scene in the whole series where I'm like, yes. <laughs> I was so happy. I was so happy. As for you, John, uh, you wrote this series in within a span of one year, right, for each book? Um, so Malice uh, took me quite a few years to write oh, okay. because I was, I was just working on that and the whole world for a long time. But once I, um, I got my, my uh, contract for mm. the first two books, then, then it was, um, it was a, about a year, it was a year and a bit for each book, uh, roughly about, about 14 months per book, yeah. yeah which one in the entire series would you consider Easy your case. favorite? Uh, I mean, I'd probably, I'd probably choose Ruin. Oh, really? <laughs> um, only because I'm more of an Empire Strikes Back guy than a Return ah. of the Jedi guy. Um, yeah. I just, I don't know, there was just, there was just things that happened in the where I felt like, as a writer, you're always trying to put what you've got in your head onto the page. And sometimes you feel like you're close, sometimes you feel like you're, you're a little bit far away from that. But when, but 
I, when I wrote Ruin, I just felt like it. I was finally getting down what I re was really envisioning, you know. Because mm. um, yeah. I've, I've, with the, this is um, the, the Faith on the Fall is the first thing I've ever written. So I, I haven't come from a background of writing. Um, it, you know, Malice was the first thing I've ever written creatively. But it's very so I feel like it's been one massive learning curve for me, you know. Yeah. Um, and 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 as a writer, you're always trying to hone your craft, your prose, or, or you know all of that. And and I felt like it was starting to kick in where at the time I got to ruin. So I remember wow. writing that very fondly. Yeah. And you do receive a lot of emails, right, over the ending of Ruin. <laughs> also, yeah, I, I mean, there's yeah, <laughs> some very angry emails, especially when you think you know, when that came out, there was a year till people could pick up breath. Ah, so yeah. Like, poor, poor people. All poor people, <laughs> poor readers. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I went into wrath straight away. Like, yeah, there was no way. gap. <laughs> yeah, I was a bit mean with the cliffhanger, I think, at the end of Ruin, but. So good. Oh, so good. I had a lot of funny emails about that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, uh, there is a lot of uh, intense moment. There is a lot of heartbreaks on reading this series. But do you yourself, John? Uh, I mean, we all have maybe shed a tear or two. But do you shed a tear when you're writing these books, or you just uh, laugh evilly, like ha ha ha? Readers going to be shedding tears over this. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I mean, I don't usually shed tears. I usually. I usually um, I do get a sense of emotion and that's usually a kind of a, a yardstick for me of whether a scene's coming together well or not. If, I, if I'm starting to feel emotional as I'm writing it or if I'm re when I'm reading it back, then, um, you know, that it's just, I find it so hard to tell whether what I've done is, you know, I'm just too close to it, really. Mm. And, um, but that's usually a yardstick that I use to give me a sense of whether it's going okay or not. I do remember shedding a tear when I, in Wrath. Oh, um, You know, uh, uh, there's a certain scene at the end of that where I, I, you know, I do remember shedding a tear or two, yeah. yeah we'll but I won't mention it right now because you don't want to do spoilers. Yeah, yeah. Do you know, do you know in advance who's going to die? Like, I was about to ask, die? yeah. Or does that just kind of happen? So, uh, a bit of both, really, really, um, Alan, a bit of both. Some of it, uh, um, the way I write is, um, I'm kind of, in, you know, you've, you've probably heard of the gardener and architect. Um, George R. Martin's famous for saying you're either a gardener or an architect. Well, I'm a bit of both. I'm kind of slap bang in the middle. Where I'll have, um, most of my plotting is about events. So I'll have events to work to. Mm -hmm. But um, how the characters get there, it, it, that's that's just a blank page. Oh. You know, so, And sometimes I knew well in advance <laughs> that certain people are going to die and sometimes it just happened on the spot you know a lot of a lot of my writings about gut instinct and how you feel it's just about trying to be honest i think um with what you set up previously uh, and the scenario that you're in and just just trying to um keep it honest rather than doing things for plot's sake yeah some of those deaths are brutal like some like <laughs> some of them is like when you're not afraid to kill a character, it makes you so nervous when you're Yeah, reading. exactly. With a cast as large as what you have in The Faithful and the Fallen, like, you just know, you're like, oh, man, this is going to get, like, like a swath. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that, no that's one is safe. Having a big, big cast, I think. You can it's, um, kill two thirds you, of them. Yeah, yeah, you can. <laughs> All right, so we want to talk spoilers now? Yes. All right. So, if you have, uh, for or those who are watching, if you uh, haven't uh, read, uh, haven't read Brad, please uh, read the book first and then come back, uh, come back to this video. So we will be talking spoilers now. So, what's your favorite scene in Brad, uh, Abby? Putting me on the spot again. Okay. <laughs> I mean, like thinking of there are some favorite deaths in Wrath. Like there's two favorite deaths that were very, very satisfying. And I feel like I can't really claim them both, but like, okay, Lycos, when he gets eaten by the ants, or like the, the, the ant scene with Lycos and Matt Quinn, getting that vengeance, I was like, finally, <laughs> I hated Lycos all the way through. He was, he was like, the, he was the worst. Absolutely. 
worst and his stupid grappling hook. Like, <laughs> still? <laughs> How are you still mad about the grappling hook? Because he snatches Maquin's sword from him. I'm like, what? <laughs> Makes me so mad. He's just really good. I know. I hate him. <laughs> How about you, Alex? Um, wow. Uh, There's a lot favorite, of There's a lot of things. Favorite scene. Uh, that, that's tough because the entire like end battle was insane. Um, and I'm probably going to blur some things with Ruin now because it's, it's been a little bit, but um, I, I think the, one of my favorite scenes was the, the whole like skirmish in the forest mm. when the, uh, was it the, was it the giants that came out and like this badass armor and these huge weapons. And it was just like totally out of nowhere. Like this, this wrench that just got thrown into this battle. And I was like, holy shit. Like, what? <laughs> like that whole, that entire like battle sequence just like kept ramping up and ramping up and getting cooler and cooler. Yeah. Um, and then I'd say what, like my favorite, like emotional scene, if, if I want to say that is obviously for me was, was Gar. Uh, ah, yeah. Gar's death really yeah, hit. That, that one was brutal. <laughs> yeah. I kind of expected it. I, I felt like he was going to perish at some point in this, uh, series but just finally getting to that point was just like oh man like everybody's dying because <laughs> I remember throughout this book I was actually uh, talking with Jashana on Voxer because she was hyped that I was reading Wrath and I just started naming people as they were dying I was like oh he just died oh she just died oh he just died I was just like all right that's getting too much <laughs> like, I, I blanked on Gar's death so thank you for letting me revisit that like so so that whole scene where you have like Corbin <clears throat> uh what was the saying like where he'd been taught where you have to like to a give a strike you have to take one yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah like that whole like that seeing was... that come full turn and having that actually happening yeah i feel like i should have seen that coming and i didn't yeah. i was like oh they set that up earlier <laughs> <laughs> freaking Kalidus. <laughs> i hate Kalidus. Yeah. Like, Kalidus was rising up my prescription list <laughs> so evil <laughs> And how about you, Alan? Oh, I think I know okay. what you do. <laughs> okay, well, first of all, the chapter where Jael gets a knife under the throat is like <laughs> just so sad. He is the most weaselly, like, <laughs> like, ah, oh, like, like when you're writing Jael, John, like, how do you picture, like, a, like, do you just imagine, like, what is the worst, most sniveling person I can think of? <laughs> and what would they do? Because he's just so, oh, like, he's not, like, Calidus is, you know, mega evil and like conniving. And then Lycos is just drunk and completely amoral. And then Jael is just sniveling and <laughs> the absolute worst kind of villain. I hate him so much. I'm so glad he died. Like I was so happy when Maquin, like, and then he's running that whole, there's just this extended sequence of mm -hmm. him being like, oh crap, Maquin's there. <laughs> he has to run. And the most surprising death in this book was Fidele. Yeah. Like I did not see that coming at all when she was just like, okay, I'm just gonna fall off the cliff and die. I, I was so surprised. I did not anticipate, I did not anticipate her dying like at all. And I was just like, I just Poor stared at the page. <laughs> Poor <Mark and Noah. laughs> yeah, but that scene, the scene where they reunite in, yeah. like, in the after, after in the off across the bridge of swords was-, was That was awesome. Yeah. Here. Yeah. How about you, Philip? Yeah, I was going to answer with the uh, take a wound to give a wound uh -huh. scene. That's already been mentioned. So I'm just going to say, as, as, especially if it's wrapped up with sort of Gar and his early advice and then his death scene. So all of that together was just very powerful and really well set up. I also love how a lot of the battles are decided by really clever tactics like mm -hmm. Camlin earlier in, in the, the battle where uh, Morkant finally bites it. Uh, that's really brilliantly done. I love how that's set up. I also love the, um, the later inclusion of the ants as being uh, a distractor in the battle. I love um, uh, Halen's um, uh, impact drag. by bringing in the dregs. I thought that was really well done. So those little elements in there, I just thought were, were brilliantly incorporated. And, I'm kind of wondering, um, because I'm just guessing from reading your books, John, that you're very well read in history mm -hmm. and 
uh, that sort of thing. So I, I was kind of wondering if uh, how, aside from, I just love influence questions. I, um, I'm just wondering how much uh, of an influence do we have from the historical sources and that sort of thing, aside from literary influences, which I'm sure you could talk about as well. Mm. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm a history geek, so I, I, I love, I've, you know, my all, all my life I've grown up kind of straddling that fence between, you, you call it fantasy, but it's mythology when I, when I, I that's how I got into, into fantasy really was, um, you yeah. know, those, those those mythological stories from childhood, Arthur and the the Greek pantheon and Norse mythology, all that kind of stuff was what sparked my a lot of my love for fantasy. But obviously, it's very closely linked to history as well. Mm, yeah. So there is there is a real what I imagine the Banished Lands as a um, as a kind of an, a myth mythical slash historical alternate version of of uh, ancient Europe that, you know, that was the whole idea. If you put a map of Europe over the banished lands, you, you know, you can see the correlation between kind of the Celtic world yeah. and the North world and the Germanic world and the, um, the Greek and Roman, that, that was the rough starting point for it, you know? So, and Caesar's Gallic war was one of the big influences or inspirations <laughs> when, um, when I started writing, you know, the, the whole Nefair thread that w was kind of Caesar, um marching into the, the celtic world and the shield wall you know taking on that that different warrior code of one-on-one -on -one. that that was the the kind of historical influence there um, so yeah there's a lot there's a lot of that in there you can i hope you can see it oh yeah it's it's lovely just a quick follow-up on that too is um I think I read in the acknowledgement somewhere that you had help with the Irish in in the in the books that the giants speak. Um, do you speak any yourself or Welsh for that matter? No, I don't. I don't. My 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 mum and dad are, are, were born in in the Ronda Valley, South Wales. Oh, yeah. um, and my dad grew up with a, a mining family, but um, his dad m marched him to um, and signed him up with the RAF when he was sixteen. Um, to, to get him out of the valleys, basically, because, um, you know, it's a very hard life. Um, very hard life if you, if you were a minor. And yeah. so my, I mean, my dad was, a, he was an exceptional man. He started off as a, uh, you know, as a private in the RAF and ended up as a squadron leader. <coughs> so we, so we moved At every three or four years I'd be moving. So I'd never really, I only spent holidays in Wales. Uh -huh. Um, other than that, I've been a bit of a nomad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, so it's a beautiful, well. beautiful place. Yeah, no, it is wonderful. But I, I've always yeah. felt a very strong connection with anything Celtic, you know. So, hence yeah. the inclusion of the Welsh and the Irish. And, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I teach the Gallic War in my um, in my AP Latin class. We teach. Oh, brilliant! Teach. Yeah, we have to read Caesar. You know, Gaul and the whole is divided into three parts. Sure. <laughs> Uh, so it's uh, that oh, was so fantastic. yeah. Seeing the seeing the Caesar stuff, I was like, yes. So now you have a perfect reason to assign them faithful in the fallen. Yeah. That's what I do. Next time, yeah. I be like, guys, you're gonna read this whole four book series and you're gonna thank me for it. We're gonna, translate, we're gonna translate John Gwynn's books into Latin. Oh my god. <laughs> we're gonna do it. Brilliant. <laughs> the Nefair, we didn't talk about the Nefair arc. Like one of my favorite scenes was when Veritas finally confronts Nefair again. Yeah. And it's like, scene, yeah. Dude, like, what are you doing? Like, come with me. Like, Corbin will <laughs> forgive. Like, and it seems like it's going well until he says, Corbin will forgive you. Oh, and yeah. Nefair, and then Nefair's like, what? You like Corbin more than me? Yeah. yeah no, no, like, no. Nefair, I think I'm alone. And that Nefair is one of my, like, like, I don't like him, but like, as a character, I like him because, because he's like, really well done. he just is too proud to let it all go. You know, like at the end of his very first chapter, at the end, he says, I forget what it says, but the, the end of his very first chapter, he's like, like, he doesn't want to lose. And that's really why, like, and that's just so prideful. It's like, Nathaniel, mm -hmm. you know what you're doing is wrong, but you don't want to, you don't want to you know have ha, all that be for nothing and have you been on the yeah. you know and you lose to to you know corbin or whatever and it was just so <laughs> painful because i really thought nathair was gonna i thought the battle was gonna hinge on nathair's nathair turning yeah. um uh, and it didn't <laughs> yeah i mean because so, at, at the end of valor he's finally to that point where he was like 
he's already too far yeah. so like he can't turn back can't turn and back. then veritas gets him like right there but then he just has to go and say you know what i also like corbin and then the there's just like oh nope <laughs> gotta die. <laughs> gotta die exactly he's like i can you tell corbin i'll forgive you because <laughs> i don't need his forgiveness Ugh, it was so tragic i was so sad for Nathair. That, uh so john that uh as you can tell from our discussion there is Uh, a lot of emotion for the good guys and the bad guys that is uh, so it seems like uh it's very safe to say that you have clicked the emotions for all these characters how do you write all the ranges for these characters i mean they are all evil they're all good um i mean first of all i've, I've got to say this this is feeling really surreal to me it's just it's crazy sitting here listening to you guys I mean, it's, it's wonderful and lovely to hear it but um you know because i started writing malice as a, a hobby for with with my children is really and my wife is the my only planned kind of audience so it's it's really lovely to hear you guys have enjoyed it so much oh, yeah. um as far as writing characters the short answer is i don't really know i don't really it's hard to analyze mm-hmm what you do uh, and so in when i try to do that i, I just <sighs> i need some inspired here's the better question real well Who hurt you as a child to make you create like this <laughs> <laughs> and who bullied you in high school that created jael <laughs> like uh, they might, i won't say that they might see me <laughs> <laughs> jael reminds me of like The, the character Obadiah Hakeswill from the Sharp books, who is equally like just cowardly. Yeah, I love the Sharp books. Uh, Hakeswill is, he reminds, that's that's why I hate Giles so much, because he just reminds me of that Hakeswill character. Like, I'm, oh no, I'm this like powerful guy, but no, don't hit me, don't hit me. Oh, I'm going to betray you. Oh, don't hit me. <laughs> like, oh, I, I, I think, sorry, I think if if trying to answer your question a bit better than saying I don't know, I think really the key with any, whenever I write a character is I try to um, to make them rounded so that they have motivations for what they do uh, rather than just you know kind of being the big bad and the moustache twirling bad guy. I try, try I've tried to write my good guys and my bad guys is just making choices. Um, yeah. That's, you know, that's the, very cool. It's almost the self-motivating choices, but you know, it depends what their motivations are. So, so the good guys tend to be the guys that are making these choices for their family, for their friends, you know. And then even that's kind of similar with some of the bad guys as, as well. But I think that's the the kind of the starting point that I that I try to see the scenario from their point of view and try and make the choices that they would would make in that situation and just be honest to to those decisions and i think i mean i don't i don't like to write don't, i don't like to use writing as as preaching but the, one of the things i wanted to get across to my children when i was writing malice was that the power of choices you know the, the cho- choices are really powerful uh, and that it's not just the big things but it's the small kind of daily choices that you make that um that kind of define who you become as an adult Yeah, so uh, you, that, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say. So uh, you made me think so much about how you subverted the whole chosen one trope with Corbin, oh. and uh, what you were saying about choices rather than fate and that sort of thing. Yeah, it, yeah. It's so yeah. interesting because that's where we see Corbin learn from Michael. Actually, there is no prophecy. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that whole twist was insane. Yeah, insane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Corbin has to decide, okay, I'm going to do this not because I'm some chosen one, but because I, I'm making this individual courageous choice. So I think that's just wonderful to hear you say that. I also wonder if there's some influence, because Patrick has mentioned before how you've been inspired by Paradise Lost, mm. which on some level, an apology for free will. Milton was trying to say, you know, hey, I, I, in spite of being a Puritan, I think free will is actually the way. Uh, is the reality here? So, um, so Corbin's demonstrating free will, isn't he? When when he decides, I'm going to embrace this role, even though it's not really um, something that I'm destined for. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That that that's exactly what I was trying to do, or hoping to do. 
yeah. and I took a lot of inspiration from those those kind of texts like Paradise Lost and um the screw tape letters was another actually C.S. Lewis's the screw tape letters he was yes. um, that was kind of the inspiration for for Calidus Oh, I see. Oh. That whispering in your ear, voice of logic, that, uh, um, you know, rationalizing bad, poor choices. That that was really where that, that all started. With, with, greater um, good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, love, um, I love the scene where everyone, like, uh, building off of Corbin having to make the choice, where everyone makes the choice, like, hey, Corbin, we're following you. Like, we don't care, like, if you're the bright star or not. Like, we're not following the prophecy. We believe in you. Oh, I got chills again, because that was, again, uh, inspirational speeches. Like, <laughs> I love inspirational speeches. Oh, my gosh. It's so good when everyone is once again pledging loyalty, being like, Corbin, we're with you. Like, we got it. Um, and so I just, like, even Calidus as the big bad doesn't feel like uh, just, a, like you said, mustache twirling villain like all the characters are just, like they're so good and i love that in these books talking about choices like character matters like like who who, who you are as a person matters because i try to teach my my students this all the time is like who you are as a human matters like it like it's not just for the greater good like nefair like if you have to like kill your dad and torch the entire country to come it's not worth it like it's not <laughs> worth it so I just, I, I love that there is, that there, there is, there is some gray in these characters, but I also, I, I am okay with the fact that like Corbin is a good guy and who believes in truth and courage and Veritas believes in justice and, and, you know, and loyalty and honor. And I, I just love that. I love that, love that kind of stuff. Oh, so good. <laughs> I mean, the, the whole having choices thing always makes me think of Rafe. Because he has had a million opportunities to yeah. not be garbage, and he usually chooses to be garbage. <laughs> like even in that, mo like just the whole backstabbing in the middle of the battle, and then like when he gets knocked off his horse, which was hilarious. And then still, he's just like trying to kill people. So you don't, you literally don't have to. Like you could just walk away from this, but it's just like, no, I, uh, I'm dedicated to the the evil people. It's just like, and come he on, kept man. that he would. So, yeah. I kept hoping that Rafe would like change his course yeah. Yeah. because I was like, he treats his dogs so well. Like he really <laughs> loves his dogs, but why can't he really treat humans like that? <laughs> like, how do you ask for mercy after you asked for mercy and then killed, who was it, Baird? He killed Baird uh, when yeah. he asked for mercy the first time. Like, and then you're gonna ask for mercy again? Get out, like, get out, <laughs> Rafe, sorry. Ah, oh, oh, despicable. Like. He mm -hmm. was not, he didn't even believe in Calidus and he didn't even believe in their mission. He just hated Corbin <laughs> and, and I guess Camlin for killing uh, Sniffer, Scratcher, one of the dogs. Um, <laughs> that's the thing, you know, so Rafe is, his perspective is these are the people who either killed, you know, my father or the people who, who I'm with. So, and I'm, I actually think that along the same lines as Abby, uh, I think I, I see some, humanity in Rafe because of his relationship with, uh, you know, his dogs. As crazy as that sounds, I, th I think there's hope for anybody who loves dogs, you know? Um, <laughs> um, Unless you're murdering people. <laughs> yeah, well, there's that, but, <laughs> but again, from Rafe's perspective, he's fighting the people who killed his people. So he's not, I, I think he's understandable. And, and John, I think you did a great job of making him fleshing him out so that he's not just a loathsome evil thing. He, he has parts of him that I totally relate to. And I think that's just really well done. Thank you. Do you have a favorite character, John? Ooh, um, Ooh. Graf. Graf and Graf. Storm, probably. Yes! <laughs> Graf, like, oh, uh, I did, I don't, I don't usually like, like, talking animals and I didn't like crap in book one, but by book Kraft four, was hilarious. I loved craft. Like I was going to be so mad if craft died. I was be <laughs> so upset if craft died. That's why he brought in another talking bird so that that one could die. And so I that, oh, that, that one was evil. <laughs> Speaking of animal deaths, did you know, like after you finished writing Ruin, did you know that Storm was going to come back or yeah. 
Okay. Because I was wondering if you saw all the like angry emails saying like, how dare you kill Storm? And you're like, oh, maybe I need to like change things up a bit and bring Storm back now. No, I was never going to kill Storm. Um, it was based on a dog, dog that I had um, in my author photo. I don't know if you've seen it, but um, I had Nikita and Storm was was her with less biting people. Uh, but um, so, yeah, I never would have killed Storm. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. When she's got armor um, at the end. Yeah, yeah. Out of the peop- out of the, the human characters, I guess I, w- I f- always felt very attached to Brina as well. So, um, oh, Brina. <laughs> one of my favorites. Yeah. Yeah, I always enjoyed enjoyed writing any scene with, that she was in. And you she's killed fantastic. her too. <laughs> I, I love not yeah, just her character. So sorry. Oh, sorry, I was saying uh, Brina. I, I love her character as well as her relationship with Corbin as it develops from that initial moment when he's trying to steal something from her house. Yeah. Uh, the the very end where she's become kind of a surrogate mother of a sort, yeah. and and. That he'll kiss her on the cheek and she'll pretend not to like it and yeah and that's just a wonderful yeah. character yeah, thank you yeah, yeah that scene at the end where brina bites it where where uh her and um uh Cywin are doing the, the the banishing ritual or the destruction ritual or whatever and then everything like it was a trap and they all rush in and everything goes goes all to pieces i had no idea how we were going to get away from that i'm like is John Glenn just going to end it with everyone dying? Like, is he going to end this book with like, like Corbin and they all just die and Calvis wins? Is that where we're going to end? I had no idea. But then the Benalim start like surging out of the cauldron. And I was like, oh, here we go. But it can't, like, I was shocked that that went down the way it did. Like Brina just disposed of like, there you go. Done. I guess Brina's dead now. I was like, what? Yeah. That's pretty rough. Brutal. <laughs> it was. Sorry. <laughs> so, John, I, I, uh, sorry, I that sort of thing is necessary in a way to to have a series like this and have no significant deaths. It's not going to feel compelling. Exactly. It's not going to. It you you've got to have this sort of loss somewhere, and and I think you picked some great you know ways to go about this. So I was sad, very sad about Brina, uh, especially, but the fact that we get Corbin's reaction to it and his resolution to start a school of a sort where he's going to help, you know, uh, promote people who are going to fight against the Kadashim. And it's in her honor. It's in Gar's honor. There's yeah. something very touching about that. And it feels, it's a fantasy, but it feels very real at the same time because you included these losses alongside the triumphs. So yeah, I, I think it was done just the right balance. Yeah. yeah, war, like it bothers me when, cause I love military fantasy and I love war, but war without cost is not realistic. Mm. Like it's just, it's just not like, especially a war to the scale of what's happening here at the end of Wrath. Like it would not be realistic for all of our favorites to survive. Like it's just not yeah. like they're outnumbered so often that uh, and so it was. It was just so good to feel that loss because it makes the victory uh, all that much sweeter. Like when you bring the heroes down, like as as someone who's played D anD D for forever, you bring the heroes down as far as you can to get their triumph. Because then it's like then it's so much sweeter. Like when they were down, like rather than just like ah, eh, we're overpowered, we just poof, swat down the bad guy. Cool, we won. <laughs> like yeah, it I'm was- glad you say that, Alan. Uh, there's a little story that um, you reminded me of where. When I was writing Malice and Valor, um, my, so my readers were really, um, William was a bit too young at that point. So Edward uh, was one of my main readers. And I remember he, he was reading, I'd just finished Valor and, he, and he came, I'd given it to him to read. And he came in very upset. I mean, he was crying. <laughs> and I was like, what's wrong? And he said, you can't kill this character. And I was like, yes. <laughs> 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 Poor Edward. <laughs> Poor Ed. <laughs> so since since you brought up your sons, I, I've been itching to ask you which characters, if any, did you uh, create or craft after them? Okay. Um, so in in the Faith of the Fallen, the you know, specifically uh, based. Um, 
in of blood and bone i don't know if you've read the second series yet but there's a i haven't yet but i have it okay so there's one of the main povs is called dren and he's inspired by will um my youngest because william is on the autistic spectrum and um and i wrote dren um hopefully i don't i mean i wanted it to be subtle but i wrote i wrote dren as being um uh, on the autistic spectrum as well i wanted to you know i just thought it was it well will's it will's a hero the way he's he's coped through his life i think and i just wanted to to kind of do something publicly to tip my hat to him but awesome. it, I, I didn't want to write it as a problem you know or as in yeah. as, as if it's an illness a lot of people think of it's oh no but you know we've William's beat was diagnosed when he was four, and it's um, and it's not, it's not a problem. It's just, it's just will. It's just different, you know. And then, and that's how I tried to write Dren in *Of Blood and Bone*. Is just seeing the world from a slightly different way, and it's just part of his personality, you know, quirky, unique, um, wonderful. So, uh, so Dren's inspired by Will, and uh, Edward. You, there's no one as kind of quite as specifically inspired, but Edward creeps into my characters fairly regularly so um uh, you'll you might see a bit of edward in my my latest book shadow of the gods in a character called called svit uh, who, um, who it, tells the chief so, boy. so Vic is from edward <laughs> <laughs> a really wonderful sense of humor yeah, um, yeah. it's so hilarious <laughs> you see see there's glim glimmers of ed in svit mm, um nice. talking of inspirations though there's another character who wasn't one of my children, but he's one of my best friends. Uh, Farrell was inspired by by um, my oldest friend, uh, Chapel Sadak. Oh. I don't know if you um, see me mentioning him in the acknowledgements every now and then. Yeah, but um, he, he's my oldest and my best friend, Sadak. Uh, he's, uh, and when we when we settled in where I live now, when I was about fifteen, my dad retired from the RAF and bought a guest house on the south coast of the UK. And and so I started I started a new school, and so I, I was a bit of a loner, I suppose. You know, you you kind of when you get used to picking up and moving every three or four years, it's, you get used to not making long lasting friendships. Mm. And Sadak, um, he was from Bangladesh, and uh, it was in the eighties, so he he went he suffered with a you know a, a lot of racist unpleasantness. And we were both kind of loners at school, so we just gravitated towards each other. But he was a really big guy, like Farrell, you know, tall, broad, and he had, he had quite a temper on him as well. He'd uh, he'd often kind of end up in 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 fights because of the abuse he got. It's the only way he knew how to deal with it. But uh, there was a scene. There's a scene in Malice where Farrell picks up Corban by the lapels when um. Corban was trying to kind of help him out with these bullies and that was straight pretty much straight out of the scenario that had happened at school oh. and yeah yeah and Sanak had actually lifted me up off the ground kind of cross with me that I, <laughs> I so I remember I kicked him in the shins and he dropped me <laughs> <on the ground. laughs> I thought um I thought for sure Farrell or Daff was going to die. Like I thought for sure Corbin was going to lose one of his buddies. But I had, I had heard uh, about uh, Drem in um, in the Blood and Bone uh, series because I have Asperger's and I'm super excited to, uh, you don't see a lot of autism spectrum representation in fantasy like at all. And um, yeah, I like what you, like it's not a problem. Like I wasn't diagnosed till I was 30, which is right. I wish I had been like my whole life. I've been wondering kind of like what's wrong with me? Like why are things... Challenging, but since the diagnosis, you know, kind of that you just process things differently. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's much easier to like. There's nothing wrong with me. I just process information differently yeah. than other people, and so I think that's really cool. Like, I think it's awesome. I'm really excited to read that that series. Um, just just to see representation of um of that because it's you know. Thanks, Helen. That's cool. I think Drem was my favorite character from Of Blood and Bone, but it's still hard to pick. Okay. It's always hard to pick. <laughs> and by the way, John, I was thinking because I've read uh, uh, all your books now and you're 
your battle scene is very impressive. It's very impressive. Even when it goes for 200 pages long, it never felt boring. Do you ever struggle writing that? Because action scenes in fantasy can be a very dangerous thing to do because, I mean, we all love actions, but they can get boring pretty fast. They can get boring pretty fast, but I never felt that while reading your books. And do you ever struggle writing uh, action scenes? Um, I don't know if the right word is struggle. I feel pressure with it when I'm in the middle of it. But um, I think I'm so involved in what's happening that, that oh. um, yeah, it, it's, it's funny because I've just, towards the end of each book, I, I, take up, I, I usually end up, um, I start writing a book at a fairly leisurely pace and I feel I'm on schedule and then suddenly it's um, the clock's ticking and I, I start giving more and more time to writing and it becomes a very intense experience oh. and usually kind of the end of each book um, is hopefully building to, a, to an intense climax anyway so that kind of so so I've got that going on in in my imaginary world but it's also going on in my real world you know uh, with my with my job writing is the, the job now and so I don't like to miss deadlines so it's quite an intense experience. Um, in terms of writing battle scenes, I've I enjoyed I just enjoy it. I've grown up on on um, history and uh, and all those films that I'd watch with my dad. You know, film films are a big influence on me really, as well as books. Um, you know, and, I, and watching things like Spartacus, you know, w was like almost a a religious ritual at home. You know, my dad would love watching those films and I'd always sit down with him. And so there's a kind of a nostalgia to, to battle scenes that, that I feel on, because of my childhood, I think. I think because you like switch perspectives like constantly throughout the battle, that it breaks it up in a way that you're seeing the battle from lots of different perspectives and lots of different areas of the battle. So you don't, I, I never get bored in battle scenes generally, yeah. but like just having that, the changing of perspectives and seeing things yeah, yeah. from different people's points of view, seeing the same scene, but like over on the other side of the battle. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I, I, uh, something that kind of, it was well, again, an inspiration for me for writing battle scenes was, um, and this was before I, I, I even thought about writing was um, when the film Braveheart came out. Ah. Oh. You know, Mel Gibson's Braveheart, William Wallace, and, and obviously I know it's been, there, there's, there's different camps as to what people think of, of the film. But when it came out, <coughs> it was pretty groundbreaking mm. at the time. Um, for well, for, certainly from from um, my point of view, anyway. I, I was used to to um, historical films as being very much romanticised combat, being very you know the shining knight or the evil villain, and it was it was glorified and romanticised. And Braveheart was really the first film I remember seeing where it's stripped all of that away mm. and it just showed, you know, the horror and brutality of combat. And it felt like the way it was filmed as well, it was almost like someone was wearing a GoPro or holding like a steady cam in the middle of it. Yeah. And, that, and that was from day one when I wrote Camp Combat, that's what I was trying to put on the page, you know, that taking away the, the, that, the glory and the romanticization and just making you feel like you're in the middle of it that's the the goal and that's what I, I try to do when I write combat. I literally, I, mean, said, I literally said that exact thing when I was talking about your battle scenes yep. that it feels like someone's wearing You're a there. Yeah. In the of, <laughs> the of the battlefield. Um, yeah. it's so great. Right, I was about to say because Faithful and the Fallen like the the battles are incredible and I, I feel like you've gotten even better like I haven't read Blood and Bone yet but even seeing the you know similar combat in shadow of the gods i feel like it's the same thing like you're immediately in the heat of battle like shield on shield like right next to somebody while they're fighting it's just i think it's it's wonderfully done thanks alex thanks i tried to to tone it down a bit in um uh shadow of the gods in terms of epic in terms of size so i think it's um, it's more intimate what a scale yeah. you know but it will get big. <laughs> I, I figured the scope is gonna is gonna expand a little bit there. And so somebody in my Discord actually asked me they were because I guess they heard that Shadow of the Gods ended on a cliffhanger, and they were like, "Is it a cliffhanger? Or is it like a cliffhanger?" And I was like, 
a cliffhanger. So like, it's gonna get bigger, but it's I don't know. But yeah, the the action in that is is excellent. And of course, when you said toned down, I was like about to say, well, did you forget that you wrote Orca? Because you didn't really <laughs> tone down much. But but yeah, the the action's wonderful and faithful in the fall. And then honestly, one of my uh, I tell people right now that you're probably the best action writer in fantasy, um, especially given like this type of fantasy style, epic fantasy, sort not necessarily medieval, but that sort of well, setting. I, I think the the action's beautifully done. And as Abby said, the the POV switching, the fact that we have several POVs of characters that you actually follow involved in each of these battles really helps because you're not just following the good guys against like a faceless bad army. You have characters that you you know follow and care about on different perspectives of it, so that's that's just a, a really good thing that I took away from these. No, I mean that's great to hear you saying that because that, that's what I try to do. So yeah, it's, it's good to hear it's working. It worked. <laughs> Definitely worked. I don't know what I'm going to do now because I've had like well, obviously I've had all the books just there and ready to go. Like I had. The whole of this faith in the fallen all there i had all of, of blood and bone already now i'm going to get to shadow of the gods and i'm going to finish it and be like well where's the next one <laughs> we will wait together this time <laughs> abby and i are reading shadow of the gods next month nice uh, and philip already has one right i'm actually reading it right now oh and <laughs> say that it feels like I'm a modern version of an icelandic saga and i love yes. it Mm. absolutely love it um and i can tell you've read some sagas I, i'm pretty sure john am, am i right there you, um, you yeah, read... yeah yeah egil saga yeah. saga and well i've got the, the the icelandic sagas but those two were particularly um inspirational yep. there yeah I, that's something i really appreciate about your writing in general uh, from the faithful and the fallen as well is how and you mentioned myths and, and all that stuff before. And I just love how plugged in you are to all that stuff. And, and to me, it really enriches the reading experience. So I love it. And I, this is something you see in a lot of great fantasy. I think you've mentioned that Lloyd Alexander was an, an early uh, read for you and oh, Tolson. Yeah. 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 He was my, that was the first book. That was, that was the book that for me that started it. Um, yeah. It's the first book I remember. Uh, our, our teacher, I was only seven or eight and sat us around in a circle to read to and that's that's the book he pulled out. Um, um, yeah. The Book of Three by, by Lord Alexander, which is a, yeah. turned into a Disney movie combined with books one and two. Um, yeah. The Black Cauldron, I don't know if you... Oh. Love that film. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, with Gergi. Yeah, yeah Gergi. Yeah. My first yeah. fantasy too. Yeah, Alexander. And you know Abenogian, that's for sure. Sorry, I missed that last bit, Billy. Oh, I just said uh, Alexander definitely had read the Mabinogian. Um, <laughs> Welsh, you know, the, the Mabinogian with all the the uh, mythological stories and everything else. Um, yes, that's right. Yeah, that's just one aspect of your books that I really appreciate. Oh, thank you. I mean, that's, that's, that's a big part of how I write. You know, it's just all that stuff you, that you ingest from from childhood through adulthood. Of, it's just that's my love of fantasy so right from day one with writing my mantra was write what you want to read mm. yeah you know and that's the stuff that I've grown up loving so it, it's you know it's impossible for it not to come out in my writing I suppose yeah. and uh it's like you're combined a lot of stuff from other genres as well right now so it's not only fantasy and there's the mythology and there is also definitely historical fiction because uh bernard conwell is one of your favorite authors right yes he is. yes he is i think the his um i think it's the i always forget title of the series the warlord chronicles i think uh, yeah, his, yeah. Yeah, Arthur Arthur Arthur. king arthur trilogy um which is right up there with, you know, it's one of my top favorite series of all time. I, I love, love, love that series. Makes me weep. <laughs> Man, I want and to that, read me, that. that was a perfect, so, sorry, Adam, what's that? Oh, I said, I want to read the Warlord Chronicles because I've only read um, his sharp books, which I love because yeah. like Bernard Cornwell writing sieges and like, like milit like battle scenes, like mm. Cornwell is like, and that's, that's a lot of what I felt reading uh, reading Malice and or reading The Faithful and the Fallen is like 
Like I knew, like I knew it had to be, like there had to be some Cornwell in there because I feel yeah. like right there with Sharp right on the battlefield, you know, pouring into the forlorn hope. Like it felt a lot like that. So yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's one of the, the uh, as far as writers go, it's, it's, it's Cornwell, Tolkien and Gemmell that were my kind of, who are the bedrock of my inspirations and that's who I kind of try to bring to writing. So yeah, I, I, I think you know it's, you'd be very hard pressed to find someone who writes combat better than Bernard Cornwell. That's my hero. Mm. Well, we have you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, we are almost one hour into this uh, panel now. Uh, uh, do anyone still have any questions for John Green? Maybe. Anything else? I, I would uh, just ask for, well, I, I think we, we mentioned some of it briefly, but when you go to write, and I know this is more so in Shadow of the Gods than specifically Faithful in the Fallen, when you have characters speak other languages, mm. is that, where is that all directly coming from? Because I, I know at least for me, when reading Shadow of the Gods, I was like, I have zero idea what this person is speaking right now. <laughs> um, and I'm sure there was some of it in Faithful in the Fallen as well that we kind of touched on, but I'm just curious where you really, I guess, pull that from. And if it's all actual just things that exist currently, or you kind of put your own spin on it? Yeah, okay. So I, I you know, I think in, fa in fantasy, it's cool to have other languages and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously if Tolkien is one of your inspirations, then you know, it's it's got to be in there. But I'm not a genius, unlike Professor Tolkien, who made <laughs> up countless languages. I mean, good grief! I don't know how he did it, but anyway. So I've used in um in uh the Banished Lands, so Faith from the Fallen and of Blood and Bone. I've used Irish Gaelic. Uh -huh. Um, uh, so that's the kind of the giant language, and the, it's the language they use for their magic. And in um. Uh, the Bloodsworn Saga, so book, book one, Shadow of the Gods, I've used Icelandic. Uh, because I've, I've, I mean, I may be wrong, but what I've read um, out of all the Scandinavian languages, apparently Icelandic is the closest or stayed closest to, to what it was like, you know, in, in medieval uh, and, and pre-medieval times. Uh, I think there were laws written in Iceland to try and keep the language to, to slow down it, it, its metamorphosis, unlike the other other Scandinavian languages, which have changed a little bit more over time. So yeah, I've used Scandinavian, and, and um, I mean, you don't really need to understand what they're saying. When when you do need to understand it, then I'll have then I'll try and put a character in there that's translating it for somebody else. Sure. Uh, yeah. When it's what I've noticed is that you you often have where there's the Icelandic, which is definitely the closest to Old Norse. Uh, you have a translation of it nearby, usually. I've noticed that yeah. so far. Uh, so, Alex, I just look for, look for something that there's usually a clue what, what's being said yeah. there. Uh, so, yeah. 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 I have some questions. I have, I have three. They're very short. Cool. <laughs> One, how, how many books is Bloodsworn Saga going to be? Two, can you actually sword fight or axe fight? Um, <laughs> like, like can, you, can you use the axe like Kratos? <laughs> and, uh, and and three what is it like what is your writing process like do you just like lock yourself in a, do you uh, like devote like x amount of time per day to like closing yourself off in your weapons room and <laughs> like type away or do you just kind of like go as you feel it okay so i'll start with the the last one first if that's okay um okay. my writing process is pretty it's pretty much f framed around my daughter harriet because um I don't know if you weren't aware, but my, my, my daughter's profoundly disabled. So um, my wife and I, that's really how I started writing because I was um, doing a, at um, Brighton Uni University and doing some teaching there and moving on to do my master's. But um, Harriet was always unwell, but she became extremely unwell for a, quite a long period of time. So I just stepped out of uni and um, became, you know, like a stay-at-home dad, basically, um, helping my wife Caroline to look after Harriet. And we, so to pay the bills, we started a, a business from home during that period. Uh, it's like a vintage furniture mm -hmm. um, business, which is really my, my wife's thing. She's very creative and I'm really, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, DIY is just, I'm not very good at it, but, uh, you know, I spent a few years 
I'm helping her with that, painting things, lifting things, gluing things, you know. But I started writing as a hobby during that period because it it is some um, it's quite intense, you know. And it was just a bit of a bit of me time, I suppose. So I just started writing, and that's where where malice started. But it, but I'm you know the situation hasn't changed. How you know we're we're we are at home with Harriet, and I'm very fortunate now to be able to work from home. But my my kind of the the practicals of, of my life are, are that Harriet needs a lot of care mm-hmm. so my writing time is kind of fits in around Harry really you know um that I'll get a, a couple of hours in between breakfast and lunch and then a couple of hours in between lunch and dinner and then uh, and then a couple of hours after Harry's bedtime and that's um usually when I squeeze in the writing yeah uh so so the other question was can I use a sword and axe Yes, uh, a little bit. I can uh, a little bit. Yeah, when I started writing, I I couldn't. It was just all in my head. You know, <laughs> I, was, I was very good at it in my head. But <laughs> but um, no, I've joined a Viking reenactment. Yes, which, um, so cool, so cool. Four years, something like that, which is so much fun. I mean, it's just like being a big kid. You know, it's just so much fun. And so on the first day on, on Viking training, and they train on the downs. Which isn't far from me so it's all like outdoors uh, which feels great to start off with and they just put a you know a round shield with a, a an iron boss in my hand and a spear and gave me a, one of their practice helmets for our first day and um i just just loved it the boys come with me as well so it's so much fun and it's 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 um it's a it's a great resource as well it's a great tool for writing because i, I obviously so much of writing is imagination but yeah. I feel like it, especially my combat and that that side of things has probably got more layers and a bit more depth now, just from those little things you pick up, even when you're not fighting for real, but, um, you know, you're, you're doing a reenactment. I mean, the, I remember very clearly on my first day holding that shield after about 15 minutes mm. in my shoulder. I was, you know, I'm, I mean, I, I'm relatively fit. I, I do some training and whatever but just that using your muscles in a different way it, it's is uh it was really shocking you know I, I thought i'd be able to cope fine but it was just you got to, to a point where you'd have to just drop your shield because you couldn't hold it up any longer you know so you'd step back and take a break yeah and little things like that and it's really kind of um influenced the writing um spear in the group i'm at you start off learning spear. So um, I've done quite a bit of that. And then you move on to different weapons and you have to, it's, I mean, it's really cool, uh, but it's, it's for, um, you have to do warrior trials. So I did my spear trial. <coughs> really it's for, I mean, really it's for health and safety when you get onto the reenactment field, you know, to, to make sure that you're safe and you're not, not gonna knock someone's teeth out or anything. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but it, you know, and the top of the tree of the of the kind of the weapons training is the Dane axe or long axe. Oh. That, so that's like the elite weapon for it in our Viking reenactment group. And so it's only the very best people, the most skilled people that get to use one of those. And it's, a, it, it, you know, you think it's just swinging an axe, but there's so much more to it. Mm-hmm. Where are I you? I wouldn't be very well in a battle. <laughs> <laughs> So I've done my spears and I'm working on my sword, my sword trial. Let me sword next. Yeah. So cool. Do, do you have to jump on a horse like Corbin did? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. No, actually, my wife's got a horse. She's trying to talk me into that, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that battle with Sumer was awesome. Like, oh yeah, oh. Sumer, just awesome. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that, that was one of my favorite moments to write. I think that that um. The duel and then then the the big old scrap afterwards yeah yeah so um, and sorry alan i forgot your third question how many books is bloodsworn going to be is it for oh, okay. like faith on the fallen or at the moment i'm contracted for three okay so that's the way you know publishing works you get a you you get a, a contract and i'm contracted for three but we'll see it's a world in my mind that i could spend more time there and and more books you know so we'll just see how it goes down, I guess. I mean, the bottom line with publishing is it, it it's all about numbers. So if it sells enough, 
yeah. then, that, then I'll get a green light to stay there for a while longer, which is, that's what I'd like to do, because I, I can see threads opening up. <laughs> yeah. so we would like that too. We're, yeah. we, we're going to be rooting for it and, and doing yeah. our best to tell folks about it. So Yeah, I know and, we're going to keep pushing it for sure. <laughs> You're a good man. So cool, right? Uh, and you will write a standalone book about Corbin, right? <laughs> that is also um, quite high on my to-do list. Yeah, um, I'd like to. I'd like to write a book, a standalone that's in between the Faith of the Fallen and of Blood and Bone. Yeah. Oh. Dang, Patrick was telling me about this when I finished of Blood and Bone. I was like, but I want more Banished Land, and he was like, there might be some coming. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be so happy. It's, it's just about it's about time and um obviously i submit my ideas to my agent who submits them to my publisher and then um they get back to me on what they'd like to go with uh you know first and it's and it obviously it's it's from my end of it it's a creative process and it's and it's fun but from their end of it it's um it, it's about the pennies you know yeah, yeah. So it, it's still business. It, yeah, exactly. It is. It is a business. So it's, it's um what what they think is the safest, I suppose. Yeah. So we'll see. I'll keep you posted. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> we'll be looking forward to it. Whatever you write, we will be looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I think uh, that's co that covers it for the day. Everyone's good. Yeah. Great. Thank, I just want to, before we leave, thank you so much, John, for joining us. This yes, was a yes. real honor and a pleasure. Yes, thank you so much. Oh, Appreciate likewise. It. Likewise. I, I feel really honored just to, to be here chatting to you guys. You know, it's, um, the whole thing is, is a bit of a dream come true. So, yeah. so um, It's been nine years, right, since Malice was published. Nine years. Yeah, 2012 that came yeah. out. December 2012. Wow. <clears throat> But I started writing Malice in 2002. Oh. Well, that, that's when I started thinking about writing it, yeah. yeah. So it's been a long old process. That's I can remember that very clearly. We'd just been to see um, The Two Towers at the cinema. Ah! Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. oh, we got home, we were having a meal around the table and my wife was like, oh, you should try writing a book, John. And I was like, don't be silly. <laughs> I'm, I'm so happy that she persuaded you to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm so happy that I've discovered these books as well. So thank yeah, you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Crazy. It took us all so long to talk about it. That's That's yeah, got to be well, a little bit weird for you too, right? I mean, to, to write these such a long time ago and then now it's 2021 and yeah. <laughs> we're having a discussion about it. Yeah, it is. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I, it, it, it's su surprising to me and, and wonderful that people are still in, you know, enjoy, if anything, it seems like the Banished Lands is becoming more popular, which um, is, is lovely to hear, but I, yes, you know, it did, it did well enough when it came out for, for me to get new, more contracts to keep writing. So, but, <laughs> but, um, for people to still be enthusiastic and passionate about it at this stage in the game is is it's really lovely. I'm so happy for you that they're like getting gaining in popularity. Yeah, yeah. me too. Yeah, they deserve it. Yep, well, well deserved. I think you guys have probably got a lot to do with that. Shouting about it for me. <laughs> so I'm really grateful. I know we'll keep we'll keep shouting yeah. about it. Like, we shall keep know. shouting about it. Yeah. yeah I'll drink now. One of my auto buy authors, <laughs> which is, I know I know that's the same for everybody here, really. Yeah, thank you thank you well i hope i don't let you down <laughs> no, no chance no yeah. chance i think <laughs> unless jael like resurrects as the secret good guy <laughs> I, I think it's fine if jael resurrects as like the hero it's like a trilogy of jael, it's gonna happen yeah. alan <laughs> <laughs> be horrible he's the main villain of blood and boot <laughs> Like, if he's a villain, okay. it's fine. As long as he dies, I'm okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we can kill him again. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. I'm okay with that. <laughs> well, I think uh, this should do it for the day. And I just want to say thank you so much to everyone, to Abby, Alex, Alan, Philip, and of course, John Green for doing this for all of us. This has been an incredible discussion. 
And yeah, I hope if you haven't read The Faithful and the Fallen, you will pick up these books and join us with this discussion and uh, support John Gwyn. It's such yeah, a great book, such a great, such a great series. One of my favorites of all time. And yeah, uh, thank you so much, guys. Uh, bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.